uh, that Nigeria's economy is in shambles is no longer up for debate. But an empty treasury and a continuous decline indicates that there is no way out of the doldrums yet. Some government officials and business leaders have raised concerns that Nigeria's external reserves now stands at only $15 billion, which is well below the $36 billion balance on the gross external reserves claim by the Central Bank of Nigeria, CBN. According to them, reserves of $15 billion will barely cover four months of imports, with the country spending 5.9 trillion naira on imports in the first quarter of the year. The danger is that if the external reserves continue to be depleted within four months, Nigeria will no longer be able to pay for imports of food, medicine, materials and spare parts required by industries. So analysts say all hands must be on deck to avoid total collapse of the economy over the continued depletion of the foreign reserves. Piquet, hmm. what may be responsible for this? Oh, the... Especially the discrepancy. You don't expect uh, people in government to tell you the truth yeah. all the time. They will tell you the truth when it is convenient for them. Um, for them. But if the truth will constitute an embarrassment to government, then you can expect that you will not be told the truth. It's, um, nobody sets out to deliberately uh, undermine himself or have himself discredited. We've been told that we were not printing money, it was denied, but there are many people um, who are privileged to know, who have said, no, it is happening. Mm. Some of these things may look difficult to believe, but it reflects the difficult times that uh, we find ourselves in. I just hope that the economy can be reflated Let's focus on growing the economy. Let the people in government focus on growing the economy so that we can earn enough. The, the size of our foreign reserves, the size of our sovereign wealth fund, the size of even the excess crude account will send a clear message of good health, economic well-being and good health of our nation to people. So if people are reading these sort of things then, what it says is that these are perilous times. Well, perilous times indeed. Mm. Uh, well, well, it's, it's a serious situation. Because like a few months ago, uh, when uh, uh, the, um, well, how do I say it? Revenue generating uh, agencies met with state government for allocation of money. And then at the end of the day, they said nothing. Mm. It's on ground to share. <laughs> nothing on the floor to share. And then, you see, <laughs> we should know that this is the time to look outside the box. The time of going to Abuja, eh, thinking that you will bring money to the state is no longer there. With the situation at hand now, NMPC is now, you know, they privatized the NMPC. Then we are looking at the uh, upstream. They say we're another upstream, you know, um, uh, you know, uh, firm will come on board, and maybe from there that one will start generating money. When are we going to wait at that time? And the cost. See, the issue is even this: the cost of government. The government, state government, local government should they should start cutting the cost of governance. Because with the situation we have, eh, there's no there's no money to share, and then people are you know continuing you know at least the little one available, eh, they are still means spending it, and they are not spending it the right way they ought to do it. Then what do we do? And the issue of foreign reserve is a critical thing. It shows the head of your economy. Many countries, they have like 500 billion eh, dollars. We, others, you know, are having like, even before the war that uh, uh, Russia forced on itself with Ukraine, 
Russia has about 600 billion in foreign banks as foreign reserve. A country like Saudi Arabia, as bad as the situation is, they are having almost 1 trillion eh, in foreign reserve. But then we are here, we are talking of 36, and there is even depletion of the 36 billion eh, to the level of 15 billion. And people are not saying the truth. Right. And then even a central bank, a former deputy uh, central bank governor, even said that uh, they are printing money for the federal government. Uh, are, we, are we in the country, Uganda, of the day of, uh, what's his name of this one, Idi Amin? All right, gentlemen. And let's quickly take our guest. We will be sharing some insight with us on the program today. Joining us via Zoom from JAWS is a private sector manager and chairman of Plato State Economic Advisory Council, Zika Gomez. Uh, thank you very much for joining us, sir. Thank you very much for having me on, on, on the program today. All right. And now let's start with the figures regarding the reserves, $15 billion or $36 billion. Is there anything to cheer or worry about in this situation? There's so much to worry mm. uh, about this situation because the figure, the, the figure that is talking about $15 billion is more of the actual, uh, while the $36 billion is more like an accrual meaning that um, the central bank normally ignores some of its contingent liabilities when calculating the reserve. But when things are down, you must recognize all your liabilities, so you must deduct them from your accrual. That's why re realistically we think that it's between 15 and 20 billion rather than the $36 billion um, reserve. Uh, it's a worrying situation because even 30, 36 for a country like Nigeria that gulps so much imports. Uh, 36 is not healthy, but, to, to, but but that's a bit deceptive. Reality is that we're between 15 and 20, 22 billion. And that's very worrying for a country that takes in so much imports. So it's something that we need to worry about. And I think that um, the body language of all officials at the top should indicate a worrying thing. The body language shouldn't give the impression it's business as usual. The only time I heard the Minister for Finance making this an allusion to the fact that we're having a problem was just press conference last week where she mentioned the issue of debt payment being higher than revenue. But I didn't hear any worry about foreign reserves. So I think it's something we should worry about from all government officials. How, how could um, our well, foreign reserves have gone down to this level? What really is the problem? Well, there are a number of reasons that caused this. Um, first is the decline in crude oil sales. From January to, 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 to June this year, we've been selling only about $1.1 billion a day, billion, billion dollar barrels a day, compared to about 1.8 last year. Why is it so? I mean, there's so many reasons for that. Um, first, the, the, the vandalization of pipelines, the theft, the huge amount of theft going on, which has peaked in the first quarter of this year, the theft of crude oil. This is unprecedented level of theft. That's one reason. So we're not getting any sales, I mean, revenue from foreign like crude oil. The second reason is the diversion of crude sales income for subsidy payment. You alluded to it in your earlier discussion, and I like the, the angle you guys took. We've been paying so much money to, to subsidize petroleum, uh, uh, petroleum um, products, especially PMS. And um, between January and June, there's nothing, nothing in terms of uh, reserves, paid, paid to the reserves. So all the money earned for, from crude sales, from the 1.1, 1.2 million barrels a day crude sales, million barrels a day crude sales, is only going to, um, to, for subsidy payment. And third, of course, is debt service payment itself is huge. Then the fourth reason is the exit of foreign portfolio investment. You've not noticed this, people have not harped on this, but a lot of foreign portfolio investors have left Nigeria. Uh, they've exited Nigeria in the sense that they realized that the exchange rate was so negative against I mean, I mean uh, if you invest 1 million Naira in, in Naira terms in the stock exchange, you compare that to dollar, that's less than probably uh, $2,000. So even if they get dividends paid to them in Naira, it's, very, it's, it's so small that many of them just exited. Another reason, of course, is the rising demand for FX by Nigerians. Uh, many companies have survived, are, are recovering from the post-COVID effects and they're demanding for foreign exchange. Many Nigerians are traveling. You know, we have a pension for traveling. 
Dubai, all those countries, with all is foreign exchange, the same foreign exchange source. Many children are going back to school, students so fees are being paid, and there are the invisible imports. Um, people go to Alibaba, buy all manner of goods, Amazon, buy all manner of goods. All these purchases go back to the same pot. So this reason, and of course, finally, the MFLA strategy of defending the Nara at all costs. This is also taking away a lot of the foreign reserve. When you are defending your foreign currency at all costs, you know that the cost of that is going to be huge. So all those reasons have caused a massive drop in our foreign exchange. I mean, to the extent that if you take the $15 billion figure, it can cover exports for three, four months. If you if you want to make yourself comfortable and say, okay, we have 30, 33 or 36, it's still about seven months export. For a country as big as seven months import, for a country that depends so much of imports like Nigeria, that's a worrying sign. All right, Mr. Ezekiel, some experts and government officials have not stopped saying that the reported balance on the gross external reserves has long concealed problems. Why this and what may the government be hiding? I, I don't know. Normally, governments want to do what's called making the citizens feel comfortable. Um, you don't want to, 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 to scare your countrymen and say, look, things are really bad. Governments don't normally do that. I think like one of the panelists said out there, we have to tell each other the truth. Um, if we are broke, we are broke. And so we don't have to, it's just like a, a, you know, a, a parent or a father would normally not tell his family members that they are broke. We want to find reasons to sugarcoat the message. But this is not the same. This is a country, for goodness sake. And this is a country with so many needs, so many people, and with so many agendas to do. So there's no sense of urgency that the government has shown. I think there's need for an urgency. We need to declare this as a serious problem so that we don't hide it from the citizenry. Uh, uh, well, sir, I just have a question for you. Uh, for so long, federal government uh, and state governments uh, have been embarking on roadshow on uh, trade promotion and things like that. But we are not seeing the manifestation of the so-called so roadshow and uh, trade promotions in foreign lands. What do you think the, the government should do now? I think the government should focus m more in improving the enabling environment. I mean, the roadshows can convince someone to think of Nigeria, but the actual on-ground situation gives a different picture. We need to work on our enabling environment. Mm. I, I, I like the discussion going on. You, you mentioned it earlier. But one, the, the major reason for foreign investor going anywhere is to make money. And when that investor makes money, he wants to take the money back for either expansion or for other reasons. But when he can't take the money back or out, repatriation of dividends and even sales revenue is a major issue. That's a key problem to our enabling environment. Secondly, of course, we can't talk about insecurity again and again. It's, too much, it's been talked about, so we can't mention. But for me, one of the biggest problems is still official dump. We still have not tackled official dump in Nigeria, whereby processes, procedures for even getting ordinary permits in government offices are still going, are still in the 19th century, in the sense that people don't get permits easily. You don't have to go through several toll gates and, uh, and, and, and um and, and obstacles to get permits, to get licenses, to establish businesses in Nigeria. And then there's also several other issues of, of corruption at various levels. Uh, we've been, we've been, I know the Presidential Enabling Council has been working hard to tackle some of these things, but the country is big for goodness sake. It can't work, it, it, a council sitting in Abuja cannot handle this problem. And that's why they've started to involve the states so that the states, especially the states and local governments, Doing business in Nigeria, you go through several layers of officialdom. And if these are not dismantled, it will continue to discourage any investor coming in. That officialdom is we created it ourselves. It's not as if it's a problem. It's a citizenry that sometimes creates some of the officialdom. Government officials at all levels, especially at local and state levels, need to think outside the box, need to see things along like business people. Because the more we think of ourselves as bureaucrats, putting obstacles for businesses and, and and thinking that they have money so let's 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 be let's sap them of the money why can't they pay this why can't they pay this all those things discourage foreign investors and their messages they send back these messages to colleagues they put it in their trade journals they mention it in chambers of meetings in chambers of commerce meetings and all these messages spread around so even if you go on a road show to new york 
and people sign up. When they come here, they find different experience. I think only few states have taken seriously the issue of dismantling official dome so as to make it easier for businesses to grow and, uh, and, and, uh, and, and expand in Nigeria. All right. Okay, please go ahead. But do you see the depletion stopping so soon? The depletion um, of foreign reserve. Do you see it stopping so soon? In view of the fact very, that, you know, uh, agencies or corporations like NMPC and others are not bringing forth money. In, in the short run, I don't see it stopping, unfortunately, because two things. One, the National Assembly has made it clear that they don't want the executive to temper with oil subsidy, with fuel subsidy. So that's a huge problem already. Yeah. By the end of 2022, December, we would have spent $4 trillion on, on oil subsidy alone. Four trillion, which is actually what the whole revenue the federal government is going to earn in a year. So it's actually virtually the same as what the uh, NMP is going to earn the whole year. So if you if you continue this oil subsidy crap, I believe that you can't see any 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 reduction in the in the in the attrition of the foreign reserve. It will continue. Another reason is the hunger for imports by Nigerians has not stopped. In spite of all this, in spite of dollar going to 700 or 600, if you go to the Bureau of Change, people are still demanding for dollars. People are still buying dollars, some to hurt, some to do genuine businesses, and some to do other things like intangibles. People are paying for subscriptions, school fees, medical expenses, mortgage payments, etc. So in the short run, I don't see it any solution. The only recommendation I would do is that let the federal government, in its body language, let the become managers of our economy in their body language let all of us know that we have reached a point of serious uh, emergency in this matter so that it will, it is it will trickle down so if people were trying to look for 100 million dollars for a particular thing they might reduce that demand also we at this point i think the country needs to revisit the issue of subsidy i don't believe it's an untouchable area i don't think the subsidy is an untouchable area because it's going to consume us all 4 trillion dollars is more than the actual revenue federal government is going to earn. And who benefits from the subsidy? It's our neighboring countries. For goodness sake, petrol sells an average of 500 naira per liter in our neighboring countries. We're forcing it down here at about 165 to 200. They buy it at even 200 and take it to the borders and sell it at 300, 400. So they make money in the middlemen. Secondly, how many Nigerians are actually buying for it? At 165. Mm. A lot of people have adjusted to 200, 230. I can't remember the last time I saw fuel 165 in any filling station around jobs. So people are, are gradually adjusting. I know people don't trust government when they say they would they remove the subsidy and use it for other uh, development purposes. But in the, it's just like an injection. Let's take the painful one once. In the long run, we're going to benefit. But for us to continue to delay the painful death, I think subsidy will consume this nation. All right, Mr. Ezekiel, still talking about recommendations, some um, top officials, including some governors, have, talk, have talked about, you know, cutting expenditure by 8 trillion naira in the short term. They also talked about restoring fiscal discipline and abandoning the fixed exchange um, rate policy. Would this do some magic? Um, in the short run, it will cause a serious problem um, for, for, for us. And Nigerians are not patient with we, 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 when, that, when such problems come in, the patience is one of our least virtues. So we're not going to take it easy when you just cut budget like that. I think there must be a planned process of cutting. What are the items that need to be cut? Some of the items that need to be cut are actually cost of governance. If, if the government officials are suggesting, the, why can't we start from the cost of governance? The cost of maintaining a huge bureaucracy at the national level, and that sub subnational sub level, particularly national assembly, all those. So we reduce the cost of governance, then that's one area. But if you want the common man to suffer the cost, they suffer the, 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 to pay the, pay, the, the, the price for Nigeria's um, economic woes, I think it would be unfair for us to expect the common man to suffer. It's the cost of governance that we have to look at, one. Secondly, yes, it's okay to, I still believe that it's okay to, to, to look at other aspects of governance, not just the cost. Um, re improving productivity is one. We've been giving lift service to some of the steps that will increase productivity. I think we have to take serious steps towards improving productivity in terms of exports. 
Um, I like what the National Export Promotion Council is doing, but it's a long, it's a long shot. They don't translate into short-term earnings of, of export overnight. We, there must be deliberate efforts. There must be real efforts, not the normal effort. We're not in normal times. These are very abnormal times, so we require unusual steps. Yeah. When COVID came, we took very unusual steps. We should go back to those kind of unusual steps that comes in an emergency so that we don't end up having a broke country. A broke country of 200 million people is a dangerous situation. All right, let's look at um, NNPC's um, transformation into a public uh, limited liability company, which many have said may be part of the problem or maybe compounds the problem. By not being able to remit export earnings directly into the Federation coffers, what other sources of foreign exchange inflow should Nigeria focus on in this perilous time? Like I mentioned earlier, the, one of the biggest untapped sources is agriculture. Um, for me, that is... That should, that should be the gold mine in terms of food, in terms of several types of, Nigeria can produce all, almost all types of food, temperate, exotic, etc. And there are many countries today that would be willing to have to import from Nigeria because labor cost would be lighter, is rather cheaper. And also the variety is, 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 is awesome. Now, agriculture is one key area where we can tap into, and that has to be with a sense of urgency, not with a normal sense of activity. I mean, the entire Middle East, most of the countries now are depending on imported food. And some of them are willing to invest in countries outside the Middle East to be able to get fresh food. Middle East, Kuwait, Qatar, and all these countries import fruits, vegetables, etc., from far off countries. Why can't Nigeria step in the gap? It's only six hours flight or seven hours flight at most from some of these places. But they go to 11-hour flight countries to import. So agriculture is one. Secondly, mining. We've been, mining has been given lip service. A significant amount of minerals leave Nigeria in raw form. And that way, we don't get the value for it. Secondly, they live in Nigeria in smuggled form. People travel in briefcase, with briefcases full of, of gemstones out of Nigeria. And they go to Thailand, to, to all these countries, and convert them into wonderful things. And this is not just the Chinese. Nigerians are involved in this. I think we paid a lip service to that because the amount of mining, the amount of minerals that leave Nigeria, even ordinary plateau state, it's about, at the last count, we heard there was about $2 billion worth of miners that left plateau state in raw form, through smuggled mud, where the federal government got nothing. So whose fault is us, all of us, from security agencies, from the regulatory agencies, Communities where the minerals have been mined, what's, what's their stake in all this? If they are educated enough to ensure that people don't just come and mine and leave and destroy their land and leave after paying the traditional rulers a few patents. And as long as mining remains an exclusive list, the local people have nothing to do with it. And the state governments have looked the other way. They might make all the noise about establishing mining companies. By the end of the day, they don't have any power on it. So we still have a lot of outside foreigners flooding states in Nigeria, accompanied by all manner of consequences, including insecurity, and taking out all manner of foreign exchange out of the country in smuggled form. So this is the key problems we're facing. And um, I remember in this state, the, gov the government went as far as to, to using security to arrest some of the miners. But of course, they don't have the power at the state to do anything beyond handing them over to the federal agencies. So again, we have to come together Bobs of national and the federal government to work together and declare it as a with urgency of now, not to say, okay, let's normal things flow. Because normal things will flow, and then by December, we're broke. Okay. Sir. Um, uh, well, let's look, let's go back to Forex, um, the Forex illiquidity, which is um, a big problem that we face. There are people who have argued that having the dual exchange window is not good enough. And that if we narrow the gap between the official and non-official markets, that the level of speculation that damages the value of the Naira will go down. Uh, where do you stand? Yes, I stand in 
narrowing the gap between the official and the so-called black market or the so-called free market, because it's not doing anyone any good. Um, in the short run, there will be a lot of pain because there will be a lot of inflation accompanying that. All goods, all goods will just go up in terms of price, but in the long run, it will even out and the pain will be less. You see a situation where, especially during the days when Central Bank was giving out dollars to Bureau de Change, a lot of the Bureau de Change were promoted by even officials of Central Bank. You might not know this. A lot of officials of Central Bank own one or two or three Bureau de Change. Mm -hmm. And if you're given $20 per week in those days, and at, at official price, and you call someone to sell it at, at the black market rate, see the kind of round tripping they were making in terms of profits. So the central bank came out to abolish selling to bureau exchange, but they still issue uh, dollars to several other consumers at 420, including travelers, including other importers, including importers of invisible goods. Now, that gap, that huge volume that goes to those, in, especially importing invisible goods, the goods are brought and sold at the, ex, at the price of black market. So there's no there's no reason to maintain the official rate. If somebody gets dollar at 420 today and imports, say, products to manufacture, when he comes in to manufacture the products, he's setting his price at the price of black market rate of dollars, not at 420, mark you. So in the real sense of the word, he is not bringing, there's no advantage to giving out. Because Nigeria economy is still buying the equivalent of the of the exchange rate at black market so why can't you just narrow the gap and stop making some people stupendously rich by um abbreviating the, the exchange so in external sense of the word i'm i support those who say we should bridge the gap however what strategy we use to bridge the gap it can't be when fails to wake up in the morning and announce no the gap is no longer there i mean it will cause a lot of trauma in society you can do that by gradually lifting out some sectors banning some sectors from going to central bank leaving it only for maybe security issues, or other, in some countries, only security and uh, maybe critical issues are given any foreign exchange at, at official rate, that if they're resenting the official rate. But in most other countries, they've abolished this dual exchange rate because they've realized, and it's, it's, it's clear to us, in a country of 200 million people, there's bound to be a few bad eggs. And these few bad eggs may have so much influence, and they can access the dollars at the official Everything they're doing at the black market rate. So who gains? They gain and we lose. So that's my argument for saying that why maintain the official exchange rate when the end real sense of the word, people are not benefiting. The actual people are not benefiting. Okay, sir. You said Nigerians and foreigners are taking away our precious stones, you know, like golds and others, and even dollars. Of foreign currency out of the country. Are we saying that um, agencies like the EFCC, the customs, are not doing their job? Um, they are doing their job to the extent of what they know and what they see. You see, they can't, they, they're not magicians. Um, they can't just sit in their office and know everything happening in Nigeria or everything happening in every part. They're trying to make sure they get the act on. A lot of these things I, I've seen or I've read in new villages and uh, and pay a few and enter the area and start mining. And they are, I mean, such, and some of the miners are even accompanied by policemen who are paid their normal allowance, supposed to provide security and not to know what's going on. That's not their job. And this of those mining from deep under, enter their flight. Now you may, you may not even know what's in their briefcase. And it, it takes information. Somebody says, oh, okay, we've seen this guy carrying precious stones in his back. Please check him at the airport. Of course, they will stop him. But as long as that information to even detect mineral, I don't think we have. We have to detect gold. But and as long as the customs and EFCs are not aware of what's going on, they won't, they won't know what to do. They're not magicians. Let us, as Nigerians, begin to like help them 
will help our country to understand that the more these people take out these things, the less we gain in the long run. The individual might gain a few thousand dollars, of course, but the society loses in the long run. I mean, with the, the, the insecurity that, part of the insecurity in Sanfara was on the gold issue, the gold mine issue. People were bringing so many people to mine tin at night, I'm sorry, gold at night, and what did they do with the gold? Did you see a single one being refined in Nigeria? No. Did you hear that Nigeria exported so much gold? So, 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 yes, no. But this gold left Nigeria in various forms. So unless we help the EFCC, help the security agencies, we who ourselves are part of our problems, unless we come to them to realize that we're destroying our society, we are part of the problem. Because these EFCC people are human beings too. They're not magicians. They're not God. They can't just sit where they are and see everything happening in every corner. All right. Thank you very much, Mr. Ezekiel Gomez, Private Sector Manager and Chairman of Plateau State Economic Advisory Council. Thank you very much for sharing your perspectives with us on the show over the continued depletion of foreign, of foreign reserves. Thank you very much for your time with us on the show today. We should let you go now. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank Thank you. Enjoyed this Thank you. Guys. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. All right, gentlemen. Um, he also talked about cost of cutting... Uh, cutting governance, but is the government ready to do this? Because this is not the first time we're hearing this. A lot of people have continued to say it. Cut the cost of governance. Yes, it's something that we have to do. The president of uh, Senegal decided to scrap the Senate. Yeah. And what happened? Nothing happened. <laughs> the, the company didn't collapse. So yes. Of that. Our our political leaders was ready to take big decisions because he said something that I held on to that if a country of 200 million people go, goes bankrupt that the consequences will be grave I don't think that if Nigeria goes bankrupt anybody will be able to handle the situation we are too we are far too many as a people for us to allow this to happen. And that's why we don't want war in our country because the war breaks out. Mm. Our neighbors will not be able to cope with the, the problem of um, the, ref the problem of, um, we will not be able to handle the, th the huge number of refugees mm. from Nigeria. It's going to be really tough. Well, let's hope that the, our economic managers will do a better job uh, going forward, was for now, things look really, really grim and bleak. Voila, quickly. Indeed, very, very, very grim. And I think um, our economic managers, government policy makers, they are listening. Mm. Uh, this is a perilous time, and it must not go too bad that we are in now. People are hungry, people are hungry. And if the federal government and the state government refuse to take the necessary actions, I think it will be too bad for them because we footed them in to take those actions and the necessary action to make sure that things eh, did not go so wrong the way we are witnessing and the way we are feeling now. That is my perspective. All right, thank you very much, gentlemen. Mr. Bola, I need to thank you. Thank you for coming on the show. We're taking sports very soon. Okay. All right.